Chair of the uh, Commission and all the members are present, uh, Senator Michael Brown, Mayor Muriel Bowser, Senator Paul Strauss, and Representative Franklin Garcia. The time's 1.15 in the afternoon. It's Wednesday, December 6th, uh, 2017, and we're in room G9 of the Johnny Wilson Building. We have an agenda, and uh, I don't know if the folks who are in attendance uh, have a copy of it, but we'll have opening statements, then we'll discuss uh, the uh, budget. There's some, um, under item five, there's a statehood update, and I'd like to add two items. There's an A, kiosk update, B, signage campaign update, C, receive report on statehood grant awardees, D, I'm adding update on state outreach efforts, and E, update on international outreach efforts. And following that, there'll be an opportunity for public comment. So why don't we begin with opening statements. I'm usually very brief on opening statements, as in, good afternoon, I'm glad everybody's here. Mayor Bowser, do you have an opening statement? Um, uh, thank you, Chairman, and I want to thank all the members of the Statehood Commission and all in attendance for uh, your ongoing support and ideas, uh, and I just uh, want to make the point that I'm sure it's not lost on any of us uh, about how important it is that the work in front of us proceeds. Uh, we've seen some uh, very substantial legislation move at the Congress and we have not had a, a vote uh, in those proceedings. And I think that uh, we should remind all of our fellow citizens about why we embarked on this effort uh, last year and the importance of making progress every uh, step of the way. Uh, there was very significant, uh, and we don't know the full impacts of what this tax reform bill, for example, uh, will mean for the residents of the District of Columbia. Um, but as close by as, as Virginia, we see the, the members of the Congress voting in my way, in, in my way of thinking, in a way uh, that is antagonistic uh, to uh, how we proceed uh, as a region. Uh, and uh, our Congresswoman didn't have a, a vote. Uh, and we saw the same thing in the Senate of the United States, uh, who uh, made one of the most far-reaching tax proposals that appears to transfer um, money from the middle class to the 1%, and uh, is long on promises, but not long on uh, economic reports or um, that will give us the that gives us the assurance that this tax plan could work for the residents of the District of Columbia. Uh, so just let us be mindful that what we're doing here today and what we'll do in all of our statehood efforts is not academic. Uh, we have to be focused on a real way to get there uh, so that we will be involved in every one of those conversations, that we will have a vote uh, in those uh, deliberations, and that uh, the taxes that we pay, uh, and we pay more than most are coming back to us in a way that is representative of our values. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Senator Brown, if you have an opening statement. You have to hold the button down. Oh, you have to hold it down. Okay. Um, you know, after the last coalition meeting, um, I was told by one of the co-chairs that they appreciated my passion, but my anger was getting in the way. So before I start anger management classes next week, I thought I would address this. I am angry, and I think we all should be angry. I'm angry at Congress for taking away our rights, rights that my great-great-great-great-grandfather fought for in the Revolutionary War. I'm mad at the Washington Post, who treats all this issue as if it's a passing curiosity, and if they cover it at all, they put it on the fourth page of the metro section. I'm mad at my neighbors that don't show up for um, rallies that we hold, because this is an important issue that affects all of our lives, and I want to clear up something. I'm not mad or angry at the mayor, and I'm not angry at the chairman of the council. I'm angry at a system that's developed over 26 years, which does not allow us to do our job. We're about to approve a budget of which I get $75,000 next year to run an office, to pay all my employees, 
to, to uh, do whatever outreach I'm going to do. And I do a lot of things. I do this job full time. You know, I have a radio show that now has 8,000 listeners a month. I reach 100,000 people a year. You should tune in. Carol Schwartz is going to be our guest on Sunday. I have a, a state-of-the-art website called Teach Democracy, which reaches out to educators across the, the country with the help of the staff that I have. Uh, we've put together a media list of about 15,000 people across the country, and we regularly connect with these people. Um, we, of course, uh, do other things in the community, get involved in community meetings. And what makes me maddest, I think, is the frustration of not being able to do my job. The people of the District of Columbia elected me to go to Capitol Hill and lobby for statehood. But yet, we've been taken, our delegation has been taken out of the Tennessee plan for the first time in the history of the plan. We were taken out twice by the city council. First, when, the, when our, our delegation was first elected, and, and we put it back in last year, after we put us back in, after we uh, spent all summer working on the Constitution, the first thing the council did was take us out again, unanimously. I understand that, but it weakens our position. Look, I go up to Capitol Hill, I'm just gonna be honest with you, and the first thing the Republicans say to me when they don't wanna talk to me is, you're a volunteer, right, Mike? And I go, yeah, and they go, well, let us introduce you to Susie, our new intern from Walla Walla High School, who's here to help Senator Cantwell, and she'd love to talk to you. And it bothers me, and it makes me angry, that we can't get the job done that we were elected to do. So I think we should all be angry. We should all get angry and get up to Capitol Hill together and get something accomplished. You know, I went to a meeting the other night and Johnny Barnes was there, and the, the convener of the meeting talked about going after the federal government, and Johnny said, okay, but I think that's like going in, hunting, for, hunting a bear with a rock. And that's the way I feel on Capitol Hill. I feel like I'm hunting a bear with a rock because I don't have any credibility, I'm not in the plan, I'm a volunteer, and I don't get supported. And, and this is crazy. The, we're, we're a really important tool. The Tennessee plan was built around us. You know that I worked, I ran a campaign in 2014 with no money and no endorsements, and I came one spot away from winning a seat on the city council. I beat the two Washington Post endorsed candidates, one of whom is now on the city council, and the other is a senior member of the, of the mayor's staff. And I only tell you that because I want you to understand these people were substantial. I'm good at this, and my colleagues are good at this. Senator Strauss has put us on the na international stage single-handedly. He's got things going on with the Creative Coalition, which is going to make our cause a cause celeb, which really needs to happen because the word needs to get out. Franklin Garcia is responsible for several co-sponsors on our statehood bill. We have 161 co-sponsors on the two bills, and he's also strengthened our um, connection to the Latino community in Washington, D.C., and internationally. So we're doing a good job, and we're trying really hard, and we deserve more support. And that's all I want to say, and I hope that you will join with me in being angry and going up to Capitol Hill and trying to get us the support we need to do the job for which we were elected. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Brown. Senator Strauss? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I thank my colleagues for their uh, introductory remarks. Uh, for the record, let me uh, remind uh, everyone that uh, not only couldn't our House member vote on the House's version of the tax bill, but your two senators couldn't vote on it as well. Uh, and tragically, it uh, passed by two votes. So the lack of D.C. statehood, the lack of democracy for all Americans clearly has implications for uh, people around the country. This is a national issue. It's becoming an international crusade. Uh, but we have a very full agenda, and uh, I want to reserve the bulk of my comments for the uh, uh, specific items. 
Um, but I am proud of the work that my colleagues uh, are doing. Uh, these are not easy times uh, to be advancing uh, a variety of causes, including uh, this one, given the state of our uh, national government right now and the gridlock and dysfunction in our national legislature. Um, but uh, I'm proud of the work we are doing, and I look forward to building on that work going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Strauss. Representative Garcia. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, I, too, am looking forward to engaging in the agenda. And the only thing I'm going to say is that, uh, uh, you know, in spite of this not being a uh, a Congress friendly towards statehood, I think that we're seeing major improvement. Uh, we had uh, a couple of forums in the city where we uh, saw a lot of uh, interaction and a lot of involvement and engagement from the community. Uh, and so we're excited about that. Uh, what we talked about, one of the main things that came out of some of these uh, meetings is that uh, we need to make uh, this statehood relevant to the common citizen of the District of Columbia so that they can actually uh, make this their cause. Uh, a little bit more than we have been, because I think that only when we make it relevant to them, I think that we get them involved. And so uh, looking forward to uh, being engaged in the conversation. Thank you, uh, Representative Garcia. The, um, we have uh, the uh, budget, which I think we have to approve. Who wants to present that? Senator Strauss? <clears throat> You have to hold it down. I have to hold it down. Yeah, this is meant to tie us. And up. we have to figure out how to get new microphones. And I'll, I'll work with the chairman on uh, doing that for the next meeting. Um, the uh, approved budget that we've gotten from the um, uh, existing process uh, allocates a total of $233,912 uh, overall. Uh, we have uh, a personnel budget and we have non-personnel items. We have distributed a breakdown of the stated initiatives that have been uh, focused on in our, our non-personnel budget items, uh, and I, I will go through them in detail. Um, specifically, we have our 51 STARS public service announcement program for which we're budgeting $25,000. That program, as you know, is, uh, involves the recruitment of various Hollywood celebrities, stars as it were, to help us get 51 stars on the American flag for statehood. We've had some uh, great response from the entertainment uh, community, and not just entertainment. One of our, our stars was the world boxing uh, welterweight champion, Jesse Vargas, who actually won his belt here in D.C. and did a spot. Um, but. Uh, recent spots have featured Rosario Dawson, Jonathan Banks, uh, and uh, our newest spot that's currently in post-production will feature DC's native son, uh, Dave Chappelle. Uh, so we're, we're excited with that. Um, we have our targeted states uh, outreach program, which deals with various groups, including our Iowans for DC statehood. They've asked that we update you on their activities later in the, the program, and, and they've sent us all some small gifts from the Iowa Steak Fry. Uh, that's $20,000. Our international organizational uh, efforts, uh, that includes our membership dues to the UNPO uh, and travel to various committees that we'll also update you on later. That's approximately $15,800. Um, and then we have some smaller, uh, we, we have, uh, Senator Brown's radio show uh, for 4840 Franklin Garcia's DC TV show. Uh, some miscellaneous items, they total up to uh, roughly $100,000 uh, in our non-personnel. And um, so we would move uh, approval of that. This is essentially similar to what we've done in fiscal year uh, 17 and 16. Uh, but I think despite the modest investment, we're getting good returns. Uh, and then there was a modest uh, unspent amount of about 23000 uh, from fiscal 17 that we are uh, redirecting into our personnel budget to cover personnel costs in, in excess of the initial budgeted amount. Senator Strauss, so as I read this, and uh, members, we've got three documents, one of which says available balance report as of 12-4-2018. 
The second is a breakout of personnel. And the third is uh, statehood initiative is to title its uh, NPS expenses. So the total budget, looking at the three documents, is $257,249. And that includes the local allocation, the appropriation of $233,912 that Senator Strauss mentioned, plus the $23,951 that you said was rolled forward from unspent FY17. Yes. That's a total of $257,249 of which $100,000 is this NPS, non-personal services expenses. Right, those are the various initiatives. Which is broken out on this um, It is. This uh, table, and then the remainder uh, is, uh, which is $157,249 is for personnel. That is correct. Okay, so if we look at the three documents together, that's the budget and how it's proposed to be broken down. It is. If it helps, I'll move the for approval, or you can move for approval and I'll second. Uh, I move approval. And I'll second. Discussion on the budget? Mr. Okay. Chairman. Mayor. Uh, let me just uh, comment on uh, the 51 STARS PSA program, and I may be outing myself as a obsessive watcher of cable news, um, but I see the um, these PSAs quite a lot in rotation, and sometimes I'm just call they, they're called to my attention because I hear Senator Strauss's voice, and then I go and look to see uh, who he's talking about statehood with. So I, I just want to commend you for on that campaign uh, and ask you, are we also able, are those PSAs running in other, um, in other areas? And what's, and how could we make that more broad? Well, I, I think we can. Uh, certainly in the very beginning, we ran them in uh, Iowa in the year leading up to the presidential caucuses. And I think it had a tremendous effect uh, in terms of raising public awareness uh, on the public affairs shows that we sponsored. And when we went to Iowa physically, uh, our, our ground game was uh, boosted by uh, the air game as well. Uh, and uh, I, I think it worked out. We had uh, a few spots running about it in the, uh, those caucuses. You probably saw uh, the spot with Issei Morales uh, that focused on DC's unique relationship with Puerto Rico. We were actually able to run those in Puerto Rico. Uh, and even the ones here uh, reach out to the metro area of Virginia and Maryland. Uh, I do think it's something that uh, is worthy of further investment. Uh, and it is um, a very scalable thing. And, uh, one of the good things about those spots is that when you invest in the production of them, uh, you could very quickly move to get them on the air in certain places so that if we had a member of Congress or, or a key area where we were trying to do outreach, it's not hard to do it. It is sort of a question about cost. Uh, let me also thank from uh, your administration, though, uh, uh, your uh, Office of Film, Entertainment, and Cable Television, and they have at times uh, donated technical support, equipment, editing to uh, hold those costs down. Uh, they've been good partners as well. Uh, but it is something that I think we would like to uh, expand and keep going. Thank you. And I, I would also encourage you to, because uh, I guess the, the once it's produced, as you say, it could be used in social media, Twitter ads, Facebook ads, uh, and the like, uh, so that it has even, even further reach. So uh, I think that's well done. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, other discussion? Does anybody need me to repeat the motion, which is approving the budget? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. The ayes have it unanimous. We have a report from uh, Senior Advisor Beverly Perry. Um, last meeting we talked about um we did a recap on uh last year our efforts last year in 2016 and to um execute the tennessee plan and so and that was followed by earlier this year mrs norton introduced her bill and you heard uh the senator say today that we have a record number of co-sponsors of mrs norton's bill uh, 141 
uh, co-sponsors in the House and 20 members of the Senate has co-sponsored the bill. So the team is working on additional co-sponsors and what we've done, we have um, prepared letters to all the co-sponsors to from the mayor to thank them for their co-sponsorship. And we are also sending a letter to all of the other members of Congress to ask them to join in co-sponsorship. Um, we know that Mrs. Norton does that, and um, we are taking it on to also send that from the administration. Um, we are also using um, other issues of Congress, uh, other issues before Congress, to highlight our lack of, um, of full democracy. For example, you heard the mayor say about the tax bill, we didn't have a vote in the House or the Senate. We have sent a letter to all the members of Congress to point that fact out, to say that this critical issue that impacts the, all of the residents of Washington, D.C., but yet we don't have any vote there that we or anyone we can express that can vote on our behalf. So we're using issues to highlight our lack of democracy as well. Um, We have talked about the campaign, and I would be the first to say that we, um, we're, we, we received money in the budget um, for the first time for the staff uh, to launch the campaign. We have we are a little bit behind where we thought we would be at this point, but it, it was a, it's a lot to deliberate on and make sure we get it right. So. The campaign we are launching has two parts. It has an in-town part and an out-of-town part. In the in-town part, we, we think that we have come up with some good ideas. Um, we have surveyed the Convention Center Events DC, and we know that we get 20 million visitors um, here each year. And of that 20 million visitors, we let them come without educating them on our lack of democracy. So we have come up with ways we have, uh, to communicate with them. We have looked at high traffic areas, and we are intending to uh, place kiosks, an interactive kiosk at the convention center. We are looking at other areas like the Ronald Reagan building, um, we talk, We have reached out to Union Station. We also reaching out to the airports, and we will place kiosks, an interactive kiosk. So when people come into Washington, wherever they come from, they can go in the kiosk. They can communicate with their senator or their uh, representative from the kiosk, and you know um, support us, and ask their senator to. Su support us in our statehood efforts. So we uh, we met with vendors and um, we have that underway. We are, as a matter of fact, we have the statement of work. This I think is uh, we just sent it out. So uh, it's those kinds of things that haven't been done before. You know, we're carving out new turf. So it's taking a little bit more time than we uh, had anticipated. So. Um, and, and the kiosk will also give a historic overview. It'll be as much information as people want to engage, but we're going to have a, a summary right up front. So just a, a quick glance will give, you know, the, the highlights. Um, the... Um, As a matter of fact, we could um, circulate copies. Eugene, if you have copies of the kiosks and let people see what what they look like. Uh, that The kiosks will be what we're doing in town. Some of the other things that we're doing in town, we have a signage um, proposal, and um, we are looking at putting uh, boundary markers. You know, last year when we developed the... Um, boundaries in developing the Tennessee plan. Part of it, we had to submit the boundaries of our future state. 
we intend to put boundary markers around our state so that with messages. Uh, for example, one of the ways, one of the boundary markers we intend to have the stars in the street, like you see the stars around the Warner Theater, but have a huge star in the street with a message on it. And we intend to place 51 stars in our sidewalk. Um, so when people walk around Capitol Hill, they will be getting that message as well. Um, we have signage, um, our gateway signage. If you recall that when you enter Washington, D.C., you will see a large sign that says, Welcome to Washington. We want to put a subtle message on that sign that says, um, The Future 51st State. Um, we, will, we plan to mark our historic trails. We think we can add some um, signage around the historic trails in Washington with key messages, key facts about our tax, our lack of, uh, of uh, vote, our taxation without representation, and uh, all the messages that we talk about all the time that we are larger than two states. We have 682,000 people and all of that. So those are some of the things that we're planning to do in town to capture uh, the people that visit us. Out of town, we've talked about last time when we talked about our budget, our request for a budget, we said we need temporary people to come in and manage our social media. So we're developing a war room. We will have two people there. Uh, we have identified 10 states that we intend to um, reach out to first that and those 10 states are the state of Washington the state of uh, Alaska um, I don't know why I can't see my paper but in, can you pass me the list of states I can't see it I can't see the letters in there and Anyway, there are 10 states that we are, we have identified that we believe that because of their demographics, uh, for example, because of Alaska was the last one to use the Tennessee plan and some other work because of uh, different factors about those states, we believe they will be more receptive. For example, we share a common frustration with Alaska because most of their land is federally dominated, like a lot of land in our city. So we believe some of the common factors with the states we have, de we have identified will make those states more amenable. And those states also have mixed delegations. And the whole goal, uh, our immediate goal, is to have a Republican join these list of co-signers. All of the co-signers uh, to date are either Democrats or independents. And our goal is to pressure, to, to educate people to get that first Republican. I, I think I heard someone from DC Vote say that when they talk to Republican people, uh, Republican members of Congress, they're always concerned about being first. So we just have to get that first person to sign on so that other Republicans will be comfortable signing on. Um, so just for the record, um, the 10 states are New Mexico, the state of Washington, Alaska, Illinois, Indiana, Maine, New Hampshire, Georgia, South Carolina, and Arizona. Um, the um, two people that will be working in our office, uh, they will be working full time on social media. They will, we have a whole list of letters that we want them to send to organizations that every day they will be reaching out to stakeholders in those 10 states. They may, we may 
expand that to some other states depending on how the workload uh, flows. But they will be managing the website. Every comment to the website, we need it to be responded to. Um, they will write letters, social media. They will write to legislators. They, we will write organizations. We will have a whole list of stakeholders in various states. And we will ask, like, for example, uh, last month, Eugene Kenlow went out to the state of Washington. And while he was out there, he met with the Urban League. He met with the NAACP, those types of organizations. And we will ask those local organizations to reach out to their delegations. And we also will create a Speakers Bureau. And with the Speakers Bureau, we will ask those organizations if they would like to invite Washingtonians out there to speak. And so we're hoping uh, that we will have the chairman go out and speak to some graduations. Um, we believe, and the mayor, um, and the delegation to speak to various uh, organizations, uh, ceremonial events around the country, and use those as educational opportunities. So those are the things that we are doing. They, uh, we also wanted to, uh, we added to our report the uh, statehood grant awards that we gave out. And um, we don't have a report on all of the activities of the grants. But one thing we have um, learned is that our grants, the way it's structured, they usually go out later in the fiscal year. So we're trying to move that up. And so to many of the uh, grantees in, or in the audience, we hope to uh, move up those awards so we can make sure that you have more time to complete whatever activity that you would like to uh, contribute to this statehood movement. So that concludes my report, Mr. Chairman, unless there are questions. Uh, thank you, Ms. Perry. Are there questions, uh, Representative Garcia? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, uh, one of the forums uh, with the adoption of this new state the state of Washington, D.C., um, we're being discouraged to use the District of Columbia as the name of where we reside. Can you clarify that so that we're clear on you know, how we should call ourselves? Because I think there was a little questioning at that forum, and we weren't clear. Um, yes. The, um, as you know, in the Tennessee plan, when we identified our future state, we identify that as the state of Washington, D.C., which is, we think is really a great thing because the Constitution requires that there be a federal district, and that district is the District of Columbia. And when we talk about boundary uh, markers, we want to show the demarcation between the District of Columbia and the state of Washington, D.C., so we encourage everyone, when you talk about where we live, we live in Washington, D.C. The District of Columbia is that federal district that the Constitution requires as the seat of government. One thing I failed to mention also, that last time um, we talked about the um, Puerto Rico election and their statehood movement as well. We had done some outreach to uh, the governor of Puerto Rico to request a meeting. The Puerto Rico statehood delegation has now done outreach to us, and they will be here on January 9th, and they have requested a meeting with, the, um, with our statehood commission. So I would ask you, and I, I don't have the exact time of that meeting. Eugene, do we have the time? We, know, we have the date. We don't have the time. Um, but we know that they will be here. They have requested to meet with this commission on January 9th. So I ask you to uh, 
uh, mark that date on your calendar, and I hope the members of the commission will be able to attend. I, I think that's actually going to be January 10th. Well, they gave me 9th, so. I, I, I understand. I just, uh, th okay. there's a bunch of them, there's a bunch of us. I think it's going to be January 10th. There are no further questions. That concludes my Let report. me see if any of the other members have questions. I had one question. On the 10 state outreach, how did you pick the 10 states? Uh, we reviewed their delegations, and um, we some of them are members that we work with in other capacities, um, members of the delegations in those states. Um, we spent weeks going through looking at every state, the delegation of every state, who the stakeholders are, the key stakeholders in the state that we feel that the elected uh, respond to. Um, I, I, you know, we did a major assessment, the team did, um, so. And we came up and we thought those 10 states, and we also did it by geography. We thought that we should go west, south, north, east. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. If there are no other questions from members, uh, we'll proceed to um, the Washington, D.C. Admissions Act. That's the Senate bill, it looks like. Uh, 1278 H.R. 1291 letter campaign. Who's speaking to that? Eugene, I think, uh, I think a lot of those things that's listed on your agenda were just included in my remarks. Um, can I see? Yes, sir. I think you covered that, Beverly, when you talked about the, the targeted letter writing to senators. Right. Yeah, we thank them, and we're asking for additional co-sponsors. We also, in the statehood update, I also talked about the kiosk update, the signage campaign, um, the grantees. I, I, I submitted the list in the package, if you want me to read the list of the grantees of the state statehood grants, I can do that. I think we have it, so. Okay. Uh, well, then that would take us to the update on state outreach efforts, I believe. Is that Ms. Senator Strauss? Yes, I think that goes. To I, I just wanted to, in, in addition to the 10 states that uh, the uh, executive uh, is, is working on, uh, we had begun with our, those outreach in Iowa a while back. Uh, recently, at the uh, Iowa Steak Fry, which is, without commenting uh, uh, on its nutritional uh, aspects, is a huge political event in Iowa. The Iowans for D.C. statehood were out in force with a big table, a big presence. They sent some gifts from some of their giveaways uh, to us. Uh, and it wasn't that long after that, the Congressman Dave Loebsack, one of the few Democrats who had not yet sponsored the bill, suddenly decided to become a co-sponsor of the bill in the House. And so I, um, I, I want to thank uh, and acknowledge the efforts of uh, the Iowans. The, the, these are people who live in, are, are from Iowa, uh, and their outreach there. And I think uh, maybe it was just a coincidence. Uh, but I do think it all works well together, and uh, I want to thank, uh, so uh, they, they were kind enough to send, uh, send us some samples. I, I thought of a question of, uh, for you, Beverly, that um, out of the remaining 30 senators who have not signed on, are there any um, kind of ones that we want to you want to call our attention to that have maybe indicated to us that they would sign on or people are expecting that they would sign on have promised in other areas that they would sign on but haven't yet done so I know anybody uh, staff uh, uh, Tomas is saying yes okay let's hear so. about them okay 
me. Um, so just highlighting one of our states that's a, a target state with our 10 state strategy. We have two Democratic senators in New Mexico, Udall and Heinrich, who we have met with in the past, but they're not sponsors. Uh, I also know Senator Murphy of Connecticut is not a sponsor. And so there are still Democrats that we are reaching out to with our the letter campaign today, um, but that are you know ripe with our issues, uh, are, are progressive, but just have not joined in a, as a co-sponsor. And I know uh, Neighbors for DC Statehood has been doing a lot of advocacy with those members. So I think we can all uh, join and, and try to recruit more co-sponsors uh, like with those three to begin with. What about Senator Harris from California? Uh, she is a co-sponsor. Yes. yes. So we're, we're thankful for her co-sponsorship. Oh, she's not? Oh, sorry. I thought she had joined. Sorry. So she, we can work on her as a co-sponsor um, as well as, um, uh, yeah, so sorry, we just turned uh, Wyden as a co-sponsor. And, and I think <laughs> that's why we're doing this letter uh, to um, the letter that we're sending to all members of the yeah, but what I what I wanted to call out um, because since some and some other people in the audience may uh, know more, but Senator Harris, for example, has told us that she would that she supports statehood and she would right. be a sponsor. Uh, and there may be other senators. I don't know, Bo, if you wanted to add anybody else who have said yeah. it publicly. Yeah, she said it at a luncheon. She hasn't, or he or she hasn't done it yet. Murphy, uh, Wyden, and Harris. Wyden is from? Oregon. Murphy just came on board. Okay. Murphy is on. Okay. Mur wait. Murphy from Oregon came on board. Murphy from Connecticut is not yet. Got it. Murphy. I may have a moment. Uh, further on this? Uh, then uh, let's turn to update on international outreach efforts. Senator Strauss. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Uh, at the last meeting, we spoke about uh, some of the outreach efforts that were made at the last General Assembly meeting of the UNPO, uh, where Senator Brown and I uh, attended. Uh, at that meeting, uh, I had the opportunity to speak at a human rights conference that took place at the Scottish Parliament along with members of the Scottish Parliament and other human rights activists from around the world. Um, I, I guess I didn't do too bad a job because following that, I was invited by uh, a group to speak at an international human rights conference in Rome. Uh, and following that, um, I am, am, am privileged to say that I've been invited to become an honorary member of the Global Committee for the Rule of Law uh, based in Rome. Uh, joining members of parliament uh, from various European countries, including uh, uh, Norman Baker, who is the former Home Office Minister of the United Kingdom, Senator Adre Galatin from France, uh, members of the European Parliament, uh, Sam Rainsy, who <laughs> was the opposition, or I guess still is the opposition leader uh, and former finance minister in Cambodia, um, Lord Steele of Akewood, who was a member of the House of Lords, uh, and Thupten Wangchen, a member of the Tibetan parliament in exile, the Dalai Lama's government, uh, and now I guess joining the ranks uh, will be uh, yours truly. Uh, and I'm very honored and, and, and humbled to be invited to join. And they actually have a member uh, from the Global Committee here, Laura Harth, who is in town uh, doing advocacy groups and so I just wanted to welcome her and invite her and and apparently as I understand it there's um, I, I guess a document that I'm, I'm getting on uh, their behalf so if you want to just say a few words thank you very much first of all Senator Strauss um, and the entire government uh, of Washington, D.C. Thank you very much for this welcome. Um, we've felt, me and my colleagues, very welcome coming here to Washington, D.C. We're very happy, obviously. Um, it represents so much to the eyes of the world. And I was just reading your posters here and seeing that um, nearly 80% of Americans are unaware of D.C.'s lack of access to full democracy. And obviously, 
when I met Senator Strauss and Senator Brown in Edinburgh in Scotland, I have to admit, me myself, I was not aware um, that, you know, in the heartland of democracy uh, for the world, people in DC actually have no vote. And I think Senator Brown first, he was, he got a bit angry, but I understand it's very upsetting because if you don't have a vote, you clearly don't have a voice. And um, that as the representative of the Global Committee for the Rule of Law, we know very well, if you don't have a voice, it's very easy to get trampled over and the first thing to go are your basic human rights, your civil rights, political rights, but also economic and social rights. And I think Puerto Rico has been named a couple of times and I think it's very clear how they have been treated. And I am convinced that if they had a vote, a voice, if they were represented, uh, things would have been very different. So I think your cause is a very noble one. It's a fundamental one. Um, it's the basis of any democratic system. It's the basis of the rule of law. And so we are very honored, Senator Strauss, that you accepted to become a member of this global committee. Um, the invitation comes directly from the former Italian Minister of Foreign Affairs, Giulio Terzi di Sant'Agata, who is heading um, the organization. And so we look very much forward to working with you in the future. And we thank you also, and this is to all of you, because Washington DC joining UNPO is not just advancing your cause. You are also giving a voice to many unrepresented peoples in the world, many oppressed minorities in the world. And I'm sure they're very thankful uh, for the platform that you're giving them. Thank you. Um, w one of the concerns uh, that was raised by some when we began making outreach to these international communities is how can you really compare D.C. statehood uh, to some of the horrific violations of human rights that take place around the world? And, and do you really belong uh, at, at panels where you have the entire Cambodian opposition that can't even go back to their country now for fear of arrest? Uh, with the Dalai Lama and his government in exile, and, and um, I, I'm, I felt we did have a place, that there are degrees uh, of violation, just like in, regu in, in domestic law, you have serious crimes and you have uh, misdemeanors, and uh, I, I think while the differential status of Washington, D.C. doesn't rise to the horrific level of oppression that some of these other groups that participate in these forums uh, achieve, uh, it, we, we do have a legitimate place there. And I'm very pleased that the reaction has always been welcoming. Uh, and the international human rights community has welcomed us into these global discussions. And this is just... Uh, another example, and I'm honored to promote, obviously, the interests of D.C., uh, but also to help call attention to human rights around the world. So thank you for this very special honor. Yes, thank you. Anything else from commission members regarding yeah. uh, international outreach? Yeah, I'd just like to add, um, I was with Senator Strauss in Scotland, and I don't know if he's mentioned this, but we got UNPO to pass a resolution. I introduced a resolution on D.C. statehood, and it was passed unanimously. So this has been a really, really terrific thing for us. And I've been invited to speak early in um, the new year in Portugal with a senator from Maryland and the senior editor of Bloomberg News. I've been included on a panel to talk at an international um, conference, which will involve, I think, 15 heads of state uh, in Portugal to discuss statehood uh, in May of next year. So this has been a really, really positive thing for us. It was something that Paul thought of and pursued and made happen. And we really are making an impact on the international scene. So that's a very positive thing for us. Thank you, Senator. If there's no other business from commission members, let's open up for public comment. If there's anybody who wishes to speak. Um, I'm David Schwartzman. 
I'm the chair of the Political Policy and Action Committee of the D.C. Stated Green Party. Speak up. Uh, for those who don't know, the Stated Party, which is the forerunner, really started the Stated <laughs> Movement. Should I get up? Yes, please. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So, uh, I want to applaud all the efforts that we've heard. I'm very proud of our city government, of our commission. I think you're doing a great job. Uh, my comments uh, really are centered on what our mayor introduced in her introductory statement regarding the Republican tax bill. Uh, and, and, and Mayor Bowser correctly pointed to the uh, impact being favored to 1%. Uh, also, it's not been settled yet. In today's Washington Post, there's an or New York Times, there's a discussion about a key issue regarding deducting. If you itemize your, on your federal, we can now still deduct state income tax or sales tax and property tax. The two bills that are being reconciled uh, in, both include a cap on the property tax deduction. However, uh, today's paper indicates Republicans from California are pushing for some uh, opportunity to uh, deduct on your your state income tax. Of course, if this is removed, it would have a major impact on our taxpayers here, uh, particularly middle class taxpayers who are homeowners and paying a mortgage, like myself. I'm still paying a mortgage, <laughs> so uh, that. Uh, we should know probably by uh, early January on that. Now, uh, I will be, be now say something a little critical um, about our elected government. I, I've been long associated with the, uh, the D.C. Human Rights Committee, D.C. City Human Rights Committee, which established uh, us as the first human rights city in the United States under the UN program. Uh, that was in 2008. And we have issued uh, reports periodically, and just recently we issued an update. Uh, our record on human rights is very mixed. And our distinguished guest uh, from Scotland, is it? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, pointed out that these human rights include not only political, but economic and social human rights. It's a fact that we have D.C., compared to the 50 states, has the highest income inequality in the nation. There are cities with higher, but compared to the 50 states, we have the highest. We have very high, shockingly high child poverty. And I'm going to just close with this. Well, this is a challenge that I think to empower the D.C. statehood movement, to get more people involved, we need to really address and economic and social human rights better than we have. And we have a tax base to do that. Uh, we're talking about the 1%. The uh, according to the, with all the tax triggers, I'm almost done. Okay, I'm sorry. We would like I won't, you to uh, submit the I report. won't allow time for everyone else. Uh, the according to our present tax structure, with all the tax triggers put in, a millionaires in DC, which have an average income, the top one percent of over three million dollars, uh, pay a year now pay a lower t overall DC tax rate than all but the poorest people in DC. And that data is available. And they have, uh, as of 2015, a taxable income of $5.4 billion. So I would propose, suggest that our elected government uh, readjust our tax structure to give tax relief to those affected by the Republican plan and uh, modestly raise the tax rate of the top so we're able to better meet unmet needs. And I'll just close with this. Temporary assistance for needy families, which is the, the uh, benefit rate, the income benefit, is mainly responsible for a hard child poverty rate. It will be 36% of the federal poverty level next year if the schedule increase is put in. And now, 
New York has 46% of the federal poverty level. And uh, this is my last sentence. And Maryland has now 38%. And guess what state in the nation has the highest level? New Hampshire. So white children, mainly white children in New Hampshire, are getting 60% of the federal poverty level in their income benefit. And I'm Mr. not saying TANF is the only program that universal child care is necessary. So please, I've stated my position. Yeah, Thank you. We like your last sentence, which I think was a run-on sentence. <laughs> You're the one who said last sentence. Uh, Anise. Yes, hello everybody. I'm Anise Jenkins with Stand Up for Democracy in DC Coalition. We just, otherwise known as Free DC, we just celebrated our 20th anniversary. And I want to say that so many people came, the mayor came, uh, the chair came, we really had a great celebration. But I would like to say, that although we may be very proud of these reports that we've had today, that $200,000 is a very, very small percentage of DC budget. And if we're really serious about statehood, we've got to put more money in it. Uh, when Mayor Williams was mayor, he had a million dollars allocated for voting rights, which is not even the whole part of statehood, which sometimes can be uh, regarded as a minor part of, st of um, statehood as far as how it affects the quality of life. I'm saying we need to put more money into this effort if we're really, truly serious about it. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir, if you'd come forward to a microphone. Mayor, Chairman, Senator, from both sides as well as Representative. My name is John Cheeks. I'm the Executive Director of the United States Recovery Initiative Act, known as DC Recovery. Statehood is okay, but we need reparations for living descendants of American slaves who are currently residing in the District of Columbia. I know that statehood should be an issue that comes behind recovery efforts. For most of you who don't know what the DC Recovery Act is, it's about non-taxpayer responsibility to pay injured descendants of American slaves. The district was built off the backs of my ancestors. How many black Americans do we have in this room? Chances are your ancestors were slaves. And I can understand your issues about standing up for your rights. It comes with a lot of different implications. I don't care. I am here to represent my people. I am proposing a new initiative act that the people of the District of Columbia will be voting on next year, pending the Board of Elections approve this, Mr. Mendelson. It's, it's very important. My committee also had the Confederate statues removed throughout this country. We are looking to bring DC to a productive scale for all the people. We have a large segment of our population that feels left out. I am not against developing of any kind. I am all for it. Good development includes all the people. A lot of our people feel completely left out and they're very aggravated. Please, let's come together for the DC Recovery Act. You can go online and take a look at it. The website address is uscria.com. uscria.com. We include everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Cheeks. Other comments from the public? Yes, Mr. Ryman Snyder. Yes, how many Republican, registered Republicans do we have in the room? 
Mm. See, that, that's part of the problem. <clears throat> it really is. Uh, up here it says that 80% of the people in the country don't know that we're not represented in Congress. Well, in 1994, the council passed a, a, a bill uh, to address that problem. It said that the official policy of the District of Columbia is to petition Congress that we be exempt from federal income taxation until we're represented in Congress. We're the only American citizens who are taxed without our consent. That's what unites us all, independents, Republicans, everybody. And uh, to that end, Eleanor Holmes Norton introduced a bill in 2001 to exempt us from federal income taxation. She got 134 co-sponsors, all Democrats. Two years later, Republicans introduced the legislation. She withdrew her bill and now is against it. She will not sponsor it. We've circulated, the D.C. Republican Party has circulated a petition. We've had numerous, several thousand signatures now asking her to reintroduce her bill. She refuses to accept our petition. Is this, uh, you know, where we have to have some bipartisan work here, and we're not getting it. Eleanor Holmes Norton should be on this commission, as well as our attorney general. They're both elected officials. They should be here so we can question them, and they're not. And... Uh, if we want to get attention to our plight, we have to enforce DC Act 10222 and begin petitioning Congress to be exempt from federal income taxation. The mayor should have a press conference with this bill going through now and saying we should be exempt. Your Honor, we should be exempt from federal income taxation. Congress has always exempted people who are not uh, represented in Congress from being taxed. Look at the territories. We're the exception. I have copies of the bill, Eleanor's bill and the Republican bill that you can, uh, I'm going to distribute them to members of the commission. We have the Republican Party has had demonstrations on April 15th in the front of the Capitol. We've had uh, Republican representatives come and speak to us at that. Uh, Representative Garcia has come to those uh, 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 demonstrations. So may you're may all I just invited. ask a question? So, sure. um, is your the bill that you're circulating? Does it change um, change our status to that of a territory? No, it does not. It just simply exempts us from federal income taxation. Okay. Period. Th thank you. It does not change our political status. In, in any way. Eleanor Holmes Norton says it does. She, I can't get her to read the bill. And uh, uh, it, it's very frustrating. It, uh, but uh, uh, the Republican Party is not against statehood. We're not. We're, we're uh, the District of Columbia Republican Party. And, Thank you. Uh, Thank we're you, willing Mr. to work with, uh, with the members here of the commission and the mayor and uh, I also, let's invite Mr. everybody the end of the year to assemble downtown at the clock, our tax clock, the end of the year when it comes up with all the money on it. Let's all get down there, Republicans, independents, statehooders, Democrats. Let's have a rally down there and, get, and come down with our signs and meet and uh, send out a message to the country that we want to be exempt from taxation. That'll get attention, believe me. You talk about statehood, you'd say, oh, you want to be exempt from federal income taxation, people's ears stand up. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Remsender. Further public comment? Oh, yes, Mr. Garcia. Yeah, if I may, Nelson, I, I join you, and uh, the only, and I joined Jose Cunningham from the Republican Party at, uh, at that gathering, and, you know, and I've spoken to uh, Louis Gorman, who introduces the bill, but, uh, you know, he's not for statehood, and so even though the language of the bill may not specifically state that uh, this is not uh, in lieu of statehood, he's not supportive of statehood. He won't join and co-sponsor our statehood bill, so, uh, you know, there's mixed signals here. When I've gone and joined you, uh, you know, uh, he's shown up at one time. Other times, he doesn't think enough of it to uh, to show up, and uh, it doesn't seem like a real effort. 
No, he's no, he's not for statehood. That's true. But he's put in a bill to exempt us that we have a grievance. He recognizes our grievance that we were taxed without our consent, and it's unfair. You read the bill. Please read the bill. I'm going to pass it out. It, re- it reads like the Declaration of Independence. And, uh, and uh, so he's recognizing, the Republicans have recognized, he had 10 co-sponsors, have recognized that we are, have a grievance, that we are taxed without our consent. And until, that's, uh, until we're represented in some way, we should be exempt from federal income tax. Thank you, Nelson. Uh, further public comment, uh, Adam. Greetings. Um, my name is Adam Aaron. I'm a native Ward 6 Washingtonian. I uh, want to thank all of you for your good work. And Senator Strauss, I have one brief recommendation that maybe we could talk about. That is that here in the district, we have the National Defense University. And, I, and each year, about 60 military leaders from r- throughout the world come here for graduate education. One of the things that really has intrigued me with the university is they're not only learning about defense strategy, but the Defense Department has uh, a very good program to educate them, to take them around the, the country and see examples of good human service work that is being done. I've had the pleasure for the last two years to be their lecturer on national homeless policy and it's been a great opportunity to talk about our successes in D.C., how we've really put our revenue towards helping to support the homeless in our home. And I've gotten a lot of emails from defense leaders about our policy. But my suggestion is I think there we may have an opportunity to make a presentation about the home uh, rule issues that we face here in the district. And I know I'm on a panel to make suggestions to them of uh, human policies that could be considered for education. So I'd love to work with you on that. Well, thank you. I look forward to following up after this. Thank you. Uh, Yes, sir. Greetings. My name is Leo Wilson, Jr. I'm the owner operator of a thought process dot com. my, my question is very simple. You all were going over the budget earlier and um, the activities that you're doing to promote and um, support statehood. Um, I support Free DC um, in their endeavors. Uh, I've been brought here as well as other events. On behalf of them, I document and I voluntarily do that as uh, part of my scope of practice. My question is for individuals who are true Washingtonians, whether they live here or not, how do they become more involved directly with the decision makers and actually contributing towards accomplishing this large goal. Um, Myself, I believe that there's a perspective that is being missed and that is the perspective of the actual people who are affected. Um, I don't think that that's really being fully uh, delivered on a larger scale. I think that if you approach things from a different perspective as opposed to we're elected officials and we make decisions and we have a large responsibility in that capacity, but actually getting the comprehensive thought pattern of the people that actually are affected by this. I think that you can get more support that way. So I ask that, I ask that question of how to become more involved as well as notify you all publicly that I would like to get more involved and I continue to support Free DC. So that's my question. If I could venture an answer for members here, uh, you identify one of the groups that's active in the issue and uh, align yourself with that, or uh, if you feel more energy, you organize your own group. But that would be a way to do that. Yeah, let me, let me just add to that, if you don't mind, Mr. Chairman. Sure. Look, I ran a political communications company for 25 years, and we were very successful, and we ran national campaigns. And it takes money to do this. And we're not putting, as Anise pointed out, we're not putting enough money into this. You know, we spent $200 million to build a streetcar line. We can certainly put 1% of that into our effort to secure our basic civil rights. You want to get people involved, it takes money to do that. Thank you, Senator. Now we're going to move on. 
Sir, you had a... Sir, we, we have a, uh, we, all of the senators are the Congress, and we'll get your info so, so that you can follow up. Yes. We have time for a couple more comments, you and maybe one more. Good evening. My name is Bill Lewis, and um, I'm with the Ward 5 Dems, and also with, uh, I'm the first vice president of D.C. Federation of Civic Associations. But um, I'd like to uh, state that um, we in Ward 5 have begun a education seminar on statehood um, with, um, we're planning on moving across the city. Now this is a grassroots organization. Um, we are working in um, conjunction with uh, Free DC. We also had uh, DC um, Democracy and the senators here. And uh, of course the mayor had a representation. Uh, Beverly, I'm sorry, Beverly, I, forgive me, Beverly Perry. Um, and uh, so we will be moving across the city. Uh, I've gone in my pocket to uh, use the UDC uh, auditorium and things like that. That's then uh, I'm very committed to this, and uh, I plan to um, you know work as much as I can as a citizen of this great city. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. If there are no other uh, comments, I think that's going to conclude the business of this meeting. The next meeting hasn't been scheduled yet, uh, but there'll be public notice when it is scheduled, which should be in a couple months. Mayor Bowser, as the co-chair, do you have any final remarks? I would just uh, ask uh, for the next agenda to include a report out from the grantees uh, that have uh, submitted their reports, which I think are due at the end of this month. Maybe we'll get a report out on their activities. If there's no objection from members, that's what we'll do. All right, uh, the thank you, thank you, everybody who's attending, public as well as members of the commission, and the time is now, I don't know what it is, 2.27, and this uh, meeting is adjourned. Thank you.